Awesome. Hey, friends. We're back on the podcast. I'm with Alkistis Demet today. Hey, Alkistis, how are you? I am fine. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And uh, we were just kind of chatting before and getting warmed up and kind of speaking about desire and intention and, um, yeah, our conversation and kind of this present moment. So I'm wondering if we could start with a reflection on like in your life right now, um, mm -hmm. this morning or recently, like what is absorbing you? Like what's capturing your desire? Mm -hmm. What are you interested in? <laughs> so many things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because you say desire and the first thing that comes to mind is a, a quote that I've been contemplating as a koan, which is desire is the presence of absence, mm. which is by Alexandre Kochev. And I find that really intriguing because it has a, like desire, which is a subject that hugely absorbs me, um, also presence and absence. And so in a very short koan, you have these three incredible ideas or concept or, or, or things which are so essential to I think the art to 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 creativity to what I do it it, they, it underlies so much of what I do all of these aspects um so I'm kind of thinking with that at the moment trying to expand it and and work with that idea wow yeah so this go on desire is the presence of absence mm. I think this could be a, a real guiding image for us today because I actually think this uh, encapsulates like a lot of you know what I'm thinking about right now at, um with kind of dance and occultism like some of the things that attracted me to your work and so I'm thinking about like what was missing for me when I'm watching this and it, that is organizing my desire and I'm also curious about like what do you think because you're just recently from what I'm understanding on the the website uh dance was just done in November um, so you've been yeah. working. Um, I did. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I just came back after a few years away because of the lockdown and because of my health. I um, Two opportunities presented themselves to dance and I took both of them. And I'm just recovering from the last one in London on the 25th of November. Yes. So it was like. Oh, just over two weeks away. I've just recovered from the black eye. No longer black. Oh. <laughs> I managed to I managed to injure myself quite severely in the dance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was very intense. And I, I did another one before the end of October in Berlin. The same um, the same dance, well, different iteration of the same choreographic idea that I'm I've been exploring and thinking with since visitation. Actually, it grew out of the work with the mantis in visitation oh yeah and i do want to dig into the content of like the mantis and this work you're doing but just like real quick on the desire so this was very physically demanding for you right and it's an intense yeah. process what do you think with these creations like what what is the pre like if we could use the koan like the yeah. presence and the absence in relationship to your like dance work like what are you going towards uh-huh you like missing I yeah i'm driven i'm driven by a desire to encounter to experience to come into contact with this alien thing beyond an experience it can be something on the other side of life something which is no longer here in the incarnate world um a spiritual entity or intelligence something which hasn't come into being yet, which I'm trying to bring into being through my body to affect me, to transform myself, but also to open into the world the potential for another energy to move through it, mm. and to move through other people. It's um That's very vague because it depends what dance, but that sort of underlies a lot of my dance work. Whichever piece I'm looking at, there is this desire to encounter what is alien within myself and to to bring that through in the performance so that's that has a lot to do with my particular methodology in both the performance and in the process of of creation of a dance yeah thank you yeah yeah that's so uh 
stimulating for me, this encounter with the alien um, and almost being like a vessel to receive a kind of new yeah. energy and then transmit it. Is that it? Yeah, something like that. That sounds about right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to like process a little bit. So please forgive me. I just want to kind of get this out because yeah. I no, think no, no. this is um, something I was really, I'm so grateful that we get the opportunity to talk because I think your your work is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, your work is really interesting, and I'm all I'm fascinated about how artists and you know spiritual uh, like occultists and philosophers how their work is used by others in like interesting ways and maybe sometimes different ways. So I wanted to know like how do you conceptualize your work? Because I've seen your work, uh, psychoanalysis and psychology is interested in it, occultism, um, and then uh, uh, like even like maybe yoga and like more religious. Uh, uh, conceptions. And then I think there's a use for it in philosophy too, like the love of knowledge, you know, like the pursuit. Oh, that is very, very strongly present in my own motivations yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was interesting. So maybe I could just parse a little of that and kind of, so to me, the goals of psychoanalysis, psychology are to make the unconscious conscious, the goals of, you know, occultism broadly defined, you know, obviously we could get into the nuance, but it's like, knowledge and conversation with the higher self or some kind of spiritual entity. Um, uh, the goals of yoga, religion, union with God, you know, uni unification with God and the goals of uh, philosophy are, yeah, the pursuit of knowledge. And this can get a little sticky and controversial because like for Socrates, it's just going towards the spirit of truth. And then, you know, in Western analytical philosophy, it's like containing the truth and having an objective capital T truth. So that's a little complicated, but I find your work like resonates on all of them and uh, with all of them. And then hearing you talk, I could see pieces mm. fitting into all those, but yeah, I think you described it in quite a distinct way, which is I want to encounter the alien, which I love. It's very visceral and phenomenological, um, but I'm curious yeah. to talk about those streams of thought that I've been thinking about what comes up for you. Um, well, for me, that's, when you talk about to to make the unconscious conscious, I would say to make the invisible visible, to make it mm -hmm. tangible, to make it yeah. felt, to bring it into um, the body is the first is the only and the first site of knowledge. It's the 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 way we encounter the world is through our, our bodily senses, and so much of that is hidden. So I speak about the occulted body, and it's really just the body. On one level, it's simply this body that we are both looking at the object as a, as a thing. But so much of, for example, I look at you, but I see your surface. I see your skin. I don't see you. Yeah. I see I see what is made visible of you on the surface, what plays on you. And this fascinates me. This I've had this sense uh, since very, very young of just the depths, the depths within people and the body that you don't you don't feel except through these dark senses like intuition tells you things but it's it's a way of knowing in the dark mm. and not a way of everything being superficial so it's very it's actually very um counter to the the way that say modern culture the internet or Instagram, these things which are all very visual, um, create ideas about the body and what it is to be human, which are very superficial, which take us away from actually the felt or the empathic experience. And for me, it's very strongly about the thing we share, this kinesthesis, the common sense, is an empathic a pathos, a suffering, a passion, an experience. And that's really why dance has been so fundamental to all aspects of my practice, because it's experiential. One has to do it. One, mm. it, one, one incarnates through movement. So well, there's so much to say about movement as well. <laughs> yeah. As the, yeah. As the thing which, which, um, makes visible it makes visible but it also makes us become mm. it drives the the becomingness of our, us 
Yeah, this movement. Okay, the movement thread is fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a, a couple other threads in there. Like, I think what you said about, and I, I love centering a bit on the unconscious conscious thing for a little while because we've got a lot of like therapists psychologists people like that in the audience so i think that's a helpful grounding just for a little bit um but this is fascinating this one thread of making the invisible visible because this is an important dimension of your work i think which is almost a more critical negative um component uh, in the best sense which is like the etheric body the occulted body it's not like or the unconscious or the spirit world isn't like in a place we need to go it's we're here yeah. and and i think yeah. that's important um so could you could we just dis, uh, discuss that a little bit like this idea of um almost like the simplicity of it it's like it's just kind of waking up the senses to what's here as opposed to like yeah. you know, this yeah. journey away oh. from the body yeah it is a waking up of the senses to to their ability to, to perceive and experience a, a cleansing of the senses and movement itself is very cleansing because if you're still, it become, you become inert inside on a spiritual level and there's a, you know, dust collects mm. or patterns get um, ingrained. And I find movement is the way to, to shift those kind of energies which are stagnant or which are obscuring sight that whether that is like vision or spiritual vision as well and especially the spiritual vision um because i'm finding as i get older that you know my sight is i am wearing glasses now and <laughs> um certain things are harder physically and so on but the spiritual senses get sharper as you get older if you Ooh. keep using them so my experience now is that you keep working with the body because you're actually creating what i call the siren body you're becoming siren or you're there's a i see it as a stage between the human and the angelic between the human and that higher realm of the between the divine. So on this sort of process where one is moving from being incarnate to being excarnate in flesh, the flesh itself, but the flesh nurtures this other body, this other being, the body beyond the body, which is still you, but which is, um, it's, I guess it could be likened to when people speak about the body of light and so mm -hmm. on, but I, I those things in the within the systems that they're conceptualized might have much more limited ideas and my ideas are really quite elemental and wild and much less um systematized so i'm very against systems very against uh i i am deeply intuitive in the way i work yeah. and it's really everything is based literally on how i experience and feel within myself and how much i can awaken my flesh mm. and so hence the some of the dancers become quite like ordeals because mm -hmm. it's almost um you're taken by this encounter with the spirit or the spirit is working through you or you are in this dialogue with this alien other which because it's a two-way thing is not you you have some control, but you also give up some control in order to find the other thing, you know, the thing which is a blend between the two. Yeah. To be transformed, unless, I mean, you have to give up something of yourself to be transformed. There has to be sacrifice for transformation to happen. Yeah. Yeah, the sacrifice um, and this connection with the alien other Maybe we could mm. put together two registers. So in your work, Visitation, and your work, The Desolation of uh, Flowers. Um, so you're working... Oh, the decolation. With, I'm sorry. Oh, what is it? Decolation. Decolation. Head chopping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Decolation of Flowers and um, Visitation. Um, there's this... You're connecting with Venus uh, uh, in, in Visitation and like uh, Core uh, and Salome in, in, in the yeah. flowers. 
species. So there's this like connection and the register of like occultism, right? We have this idea of like sympathy, like the way to get mm -hmm. in to connection with Venus is like, I've got roses. I've got like a rose tattoo. I'm wearing a got rose. It. I'm trying to, I'm talking to you <laughs> like I'm trying to. Yeah. With Venus. Same. Yeah. Yeah. And then in therapy, actually, I think in psychology, this is a connection that's just emerging for me is we have this idea of empathy. Um, you right. know, when you're, and that's very important, but you were talking to me, it's like, I don't know you yet. Like, I only see the surface of you. So like, I'm not able to reveal to you like, oh, my heart is beating fast because I'm nervous and I want to say the right thing. <laughs> you know, there's all these there's internal. There's so much else going on. Yeah. That yeah. I just look like a stoic man sitting here, but inside <laughs> you know, uh, there's so much going on <laughs> in, in, in our work, yeah. in our work. Yeah we're supposed to connect with that with empathy. And so there's this kind of merging that happens. And there's something about movement, maybe we could talk about, this is what I'm trying to bring movement into and your work into the sphere is because I can know someone on such a deep level when moving with them or witnessing them move. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so maybe this revealing this right, because I know revelation is a big part of your work too. So this idea of a revelation. Yeah, that, that's how I understand Revelation. That's a big part of how I understand it, um, Apocalypsis. And that's why that sequence of dances, I, I was thinking of them as an apocalyptaria. They are to do with the idea of something being shown or revealed or unveiled. And because that's literally all it means, like the word apocalypteria was simply the unveiling of a statue in the ancient world. It's a, It's not apocalypses in doom destruction and it's just this something coming to sight yes and it's also why i i um used the quote um from anaxagoras at the beginning of my piece on the occulted body that appearances are a sight of the unseen because i think it's beautiful how like you say when you see someone move or when you move with someone you experience and understand them on a very deep level on an empathic level because that triggers that response in the body and not not a the response that triggers when you're scrolling through instagram for example which is much more competitive which is much more distant there's yeah. no sympathy there and i think that's one of the biggest drivers of this uh, mental health collapse that people are experiencing is that actually it removes us from our own humanity and other people yeah. and the important thing about movement and being in touch with people is that it actually brings you into the humanity it starts bringing you closer to other people and also to yourself to understand who you are and movement also endows you with that feeling of power um, in a very basic sense of being able to do something being able to move however one moves is a doing and not a being subjected to there is agency in it so it's really important to have that sense of agency within oneself, but also to acknowledge other people's agency in movement. So dancing is a great way to do this, dancing with people or, or any kind of movement, any kind of and touch as well, like therapy things. Um, mm -hmm. I used to, I studied shiatsu for a year only, unfortunately, but I did um, a foundation course in shiatsu and it gave me a very... It, it taught me how to see into other bodies just by touching them. And one only has to touch them very lightly or even like just above the surface. You can just touch part of the auric field and just start feeling deeper into the person. You, But you actually get this just by standing opposite someone. But there's something about when someone is, is just lying and allowing you, just allowing you to place your hand on them. And it... There's a communication that happens there on a very deep level. And I think these things are so important to us as, as beings, as creatures. Yeah, so important. And I actually kind of want to linger and pause. Like part of me in, inside is like wanting to explode off into different associations that are happening. But another part of me is like really wanting to linger and pause on the agency point um, with dance. And and I think like what really could enrich us in the audience, like learning from you is, and being inspired by your work is there is something that can happen that I think is really coming through your work, which is a really deep engagement through the dark senses, you know, through the interior visualization, through the altered states, through the proprioception uh, touch that, you know, so a technique in trauma therapy and dance is like, 
I've been attacked or my agency or power has been taken away. So like in the present moment, do what you wish you would have done or like push or collapse or whatever movements that want to, that have been trapped, uh, let them happen now in a, in a container. And I think almost like pouring jet, like if we can pay attention to what's happening during, like in ourselves as therapists or uh, people doing the, the movements, like yeah. this can really, I think, enrich our practice. It's something I'm like really going to be working with is like uh, waking up the dark senses in some of these techniques. Because I think sometimes the techniques are there, but the inner the inner vision is kind of lost and occulted. You know, it's not something yeah. we're taught in therapy school or I haven't even really heard of it until I encountered your work. Um, just intuitively, it makes sense. But yes, yeah, so I wanted to linger on that point because I think doing the movements, and I'm curious what your take on this, like doing the movements, like pushing is good, but also like the, what is it like to push away? You know, what is happening on the inside of my body as I push away? Um, it, it's also coming up for me as you're talking. What do you think? Um, what do you mean? What uh, What is happening on the inside and the pushing away? You mean in the encounter with this? Yeah. So, yeah. So like maybe just giving you like, we're coming out of a system, a Western, so I'm in America too, so trained in a very Western, and it's prescriptive, right? It's like, you have trauma, and so now, and I think one of the dangers of bringing dance into this system is like, you have trauma, so do so do a pushing away movement, and it can be... Ah, okay. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I, mean, I have I'm some... Like, sort of blood. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, um, this rejection or or against trauma that is very current at the moment. And even the word trauma is again and again and again used. And I feel that it's almost blocking someone because I've had some trauma in my life, but mm. the way I've actually, I didn't have access to therapy. I, the, I had very little opportunities to work with people or have any sort of therapeutic um, modalities to experience them so I kind of had to do it on my own <laughs> and it was more about absorbing the trauma and recognizing like so I consider myself not not in any way a therapist or my dance is not really anything to do with therapy but as an artist I just accept what's happened to me and get on with it I mean it sounds terribly but I absorb it and I work with it and I don't have to understand it. It's, of course, there are huge issues. These things can leave terrible scars on the body and psyche. But if I didn't have my traumas, I wouldn't be producing this work. So as an artist, I think there's a very deep, I mean, obviously it depends on the nature of the trauma, but I think there's a very, and, and also the, the disease, if you could say that as well, the, the, mm -hmm. The illness. I am interested in illness mm -hmm. in relation to dance, but there is a very deep connection where creativity is born out of these kind of traumas or adversities and illnesses. And that is really quite mysterious how this happens. It takes it into the realm of the sacred. Mm. Um, it is. Oh, this is really thinking about. For me, the creativity is so linked to these issues that I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine how to be creative without it. So I've always worked with, whether it's physical or, or mental, um, I don't I don't make the separation, but I, I, I'm, because of the way I my physiology is <laughs> I, yeah. I feel like I'm getting stuck here um maybe if I just speak for myself because I can't really talk for what other people experience mm -hmm. I'm driven very much by the need to to work with my body in order to even be able to manage these energies to process them yes um, I used to be a painter I used to paint and I thought I would be an artist, but I kind of broke down with that because I would just have these catastrophic depressions. And if I was painting, 
and I wouldn't be able to. So I, I kind of moved into dance because everything was starting to manifest or break through my body. It was starting to, the only way I could express myself was, was in silence through gestures. And it was really, and I discovered Bhutto and mm. it just, when I saw it, like I, I describe it like a kind of a shock that this was suddenly the thing that felt on a level so much like I had to learn this way of moving. I didn't realize it was possible to be a dancer like this because my mother was a dancer, but a ballet dancer. So mm. my understanding of dance was that you had to be perfect and graceful and these things. And I felt like, you know, an ugly, strange thing that was deformed in some way, spiritually and physically. And I couldn't imagine my movements ever having anything to do with what people call dance. And then I discovered Bhutto and the work of Hichikata Tatsumi. And so I saw that there was this dark dance, which belongs, you could say, to the occulted or the dark body, this, this other side of it. And that just fascinated me on every single level, like everything lit up with that. And I started dancing immediately, like encountering this um, and continually refining now what I want to do with that, not uh, staying within the sort of aesthetics of Bhutto or whatever yeah. this has become, but really very much just interested in doing my own dance without defining it. But it's definitely Hijikata's thinking, which is the, the foundational material um, and practical sort of methodological approaches that came through my Bhutto teachers that I've incorporated and, and, and drawn out my own interests from. Yes. Ooh, wow, this is a rich one. Okay, so <laughs> thank you for this point about um, pushing away trauma and absorption because it connects very deeply um, with, I think, the conversation we were having a little earlier about encountering the alien. And so I'm thinking of you know, encountering, and this will lead, I think, nicely into eroticism, um, some of the other, and also parenthood, because um, you make some really interesting points about that. But this encountering, like, oh, here is a sexually violent force. Like, this is something that is very alien to me, as, you know, maybe as a child or as an adult. Yeah. There's an, And maybe there's something about, uh, that is empowering, actually, about okay, what is this? Let me take this into myself and integrate it and explore, like, what is this on, like, this eruption of rage and sexuality, like, this archetype, like, looking at it on archetype, like, that is very interesting artistically, magically, and therapeutically. So this is helpful for me. So thank you. Like, on my personal therapy journey, stop pushing things. <laughs> um, and then yeah. there's this other thing. Well, you know, Bouteau and ballet, that's very, very rich. Like these kind of, I'm, I'm, maybe we can do a little experiment. So what if we viewed ba ballet and Bouteau as like siblings, um, like sisters? Yeah, yeah. And we view them as sisters. And then we explore this point, because I noticed that a lot of difficulty happens. And you made a, a point about competitive love and Instagram, too. Like oh, there's this competitive uh -huh. Oh, yeah, this. Yeah. yeah. And I've noticed that the competition for attention in the family system, that's a tough, tough uh -huh. to deal with. Like mother, because so you made this point in one of your talks about like our mother's love. I think it was specifically mother daughter, but, um, you know, mm -hmm. they transmit something to us through their nurturing. And there's something very erotic about it. Um, that's really beautiful. Um, I'm sure that's for sons as well i mean the mother is the first person who awakens our eroticism yeah because of that contact because she's the first person who's awaking this sense of touch and skin it's the first person that we spend so much time just you know breathing in the scent of the the skin living in her hormonal and and sensual realm and being being touched by her being like looked at by her all of this so this is that this is the initial awakenings of eroticism within us is in this um once we're born is also with the mother not just within the the amniotic world but also when we are released from that relationship which is very interesting because it's very competitive inside the body inside the body like there is this strange the the child the mother and the child are actually at war in many ways the fetus because they are 
the fetus wants to extract as much from the mother's body as possible and she's got to keep tricking it with hormones to like uh, and different things to to stop mm -hmm. it like taking all of her substance yeah. so there is a the more one studies these relationships and the body and looks into it there is like initially there's this battle for life between them between the person that you're giving life who's giving you life then when you are born into the world it's her who is feeding you but also who is touching you who's opening this awareness on the surface of the skin that touches you very deeply and looks at you. So you have the touch of the eyes, the touch of the hands, the skin. Mm. The, um, this is this is the initial awakening of sexuality. Yes. Before it's become, before it's uh, differentiated, because I think you know you have as you grow up, then you encounter those experiences which imprint on you and which start to give the you know the fingerprint the specificity the the uniqueness i think the the sexuality our sexualities are unique to us in the way that fingerprints are or, or the iris you know these things are very specific and they are also changing through life we can go through situations that are that volatilize these structures and recombine them and create our sexuality again in a way that can happen like pornography is one of the things which can mm. um well for a start i think it's like not it's recognized that female sexuality is more plastic than male sexuality yeah. but i think pornography is one of the things that can create um fluidity in male sexuality because it's so profoundly stimulating yeah so i think and it's very unusual because it's not something that until recently people could be so um exposed to like the experience of other people's bodies and looking at them is very recent. It's not something that we are prepared for on an evolutionary level, but we have all of these uh, reactions which are deeply embedded in our evolutionary psychology and in just our bodies, our bodies' reactions. So our potentials. Yeah. Okay, so definitely want to bridge into uh, gender and feminine yeah. and sexuality. That, but just a quick pause um, on that because I wanna just note as like a process reflection is that insight about um, eroticism and the fan and the mom, the, the caregiver, mm -hmm. I think is so deeply interesting, especially to psychoanalysis. Um, Cause you have a whole discourse about Oedipus, you know, there's a whole discourse that you're work is like very relevant to and it's to me it's new and interesting and i just want to make a process reflection that i think and correct me if i'm wrong but this is coming out it's a this knowledge is revealed to you through through your your dance like this flower thing you did was exploring this whole topic yeah yes that was that had a lot to do with that um it was on one level very personal my relationship to yeah. my mother and therefore between my body and her body and her dance and my dance um, her choices in life and my choices it was that symbol of the nymph the bride mm. the young like the nubile young woman this um the way i figured the dance um i forgot the name of the researcher um there is a research that reconsiders as an anthropological um scholar who reconsiders the dance of salome in terms of um the Menarch as a dance, like a ritual dance that is performed at Menarch. Oh. And because there's no way that a princess would be a performing, like, you know, that level is not. So what's really going on is something to do with uh, a ritual performance at Menarch, um, a ritual dance. So I took this as the, the basic, like the an underlying idea, but I also wanted to, because I have I had a long time fascination with the figure of Cori Persephone and also again her coming of ageness that as she is picking flowers I, she is awakening to her sexuality at this so both her body is coming into like ripeness and it's also her her psyche is is also at the same time wants love or a sexual experience even if it's not able to articulate that yet so she is in the fields plucking flowers and 
There's the bell. I'm back. <laughs> Hi. All sorted. Um, cool. So I was, where should I start again? From Persephone, Corey? Yeah, Um. just real quick, I forgot to ask you, um, how are you on time? What's your time situation? I never asked. I don't have any problem with time. No interruptions now. That was the one thing. Okay. So. Cool, cool. We'll just keep going until yeah. oh, the interruption strikes. But yeah. <laughs> you say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so yeah, just pick up with uh, Corey. Yes. Okay, I'll just have a glass of water. Good, yeah. Good idea. Mm. So I was interested in this moment of her sexual awakening, her her opening to the world in this deeply uh it, it's not it's not here. It's something that starts in the sex that opens and drives. Um, I was going back to my own memories of this time and also how much that very powerful, youthful sexual energy drives so much of what you do, like from, I guess, 14 or, or whenever it like opens for you into like throughout the 20s, like your your youth is really so driven by this powerful force so it's really fascinated me the opening of it and this and how much is unleashed and how many rituals there are around it in the world and not now in the modern west of course because we've lost so much of these ways of structuring and and navigating these dangerous moments but because of the power of sex mm. and because of the power of the young woman in sex as the sort of the currency, Klosowski mm. would call like the, the the body of the young woman is the living currency underlying everything. And simply because she, she is the one who reproduces. So everything comes through this body and this body suddenly becoming sexually alive is a very interesting moment. It, it, it unleashes so much, uh, it destabilizes. It can destabilize um, I, I experienced a lot of like conflict in relation to my father but long before this started, but it obviously got worse when I reached um, being a teenager. And I saw it happen again with my sister, who's 18 years younger than me. So I was much older mm. and I saw that precise moment when the the young girl, woman, becomes a problem in the world you know like it starts to to change all the relationships around and there's um it's not actually very easy to navigate those those things and a lot of it gets demonized or it gets used by other people because as a young woman you load like nothing you know nothing about this at all you're right. just experiencing it I mean, it might be different now because people are subjected to so much through social media and through youtube or whatever they have a i think people grow up differently to the way I grew up they are exposed to a lot more so but I wanted to to bring out this in the dance the decollation of flowers how how people lose their heads how flowers are deflowered how <laughs> how the 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 woman and the flowers the young men are also part of this like the the young men who Corey is picking because they're the flowers oh yes There's also this um aspect to it like the, the beauty of the male youth as well is something which is preyed upon um, a lot. And 
it's a, it's really it's a, just a fascinating thing there's I, I can't say I understand but through the dancing I wanted to evoke this and through this idea of concealing and revealing at the same time so the dance is using the veils in order yeah. to um play with this idea where the girl is coming into power to understand what it is to reveal herself but also what it is to close something and to hide it what is seen what is not seen and so on and how this destabilizes the the, the and reconfigures the world around her yes oh alkasis do i have your permission to do a little bit of a symbolic analysis no, you're welcome to. <laughs> okay, because I think how I'm encountering your work is both in this really interesting way and both negative and critical, like as a tool to criticize in a yes. sense, in a tool of critique, and then a yeah. positive like thing to go towards that I like. Yeah. That I see in what you're sharing, both of those right there, because in through both your dance and your stories, like the experience with your father and then witnessing your sister as well. Um, so this like beheading, right? Like this, of, and then you, you're very specifically calling on uh, John the Baptist and Salome, like the, the the myth. And she cuts his head, or she, she through her dance, like his head is taken off. And I think this is so interesting because the head is, you know, for me, like rationality and uh, thinking, yes. disembodied <laughs> rationality. And, and so it's good. Like Salome, like she is for Jung, uh, Carl Jung is a hero. You know, she's good. She's uh, in the shadow. But, you know, this is an important figure in our psychological development for, for young. And I, yeah. I and so I, I hear what you're saying. I, like there's this and that's why I was lingering on this point is like you're through these um, embodied rituals and dances, like you're encountering like very interesting truth truths, you know, and that are supporting our work. Um, and, and so we can't necessarily and then you use literally the term, which I was so happy, uh, revealing and concealing. And so there is a discourse in philosophy about like how each this truth discourse bo both reveals and conceals. And so like objective rationality and being in a lab definitely reveals something, but then it also conceals a lot. And then similarly through the body. And I feel that, that your work is like, okay, like we can know the surface of Venus kind of bouncing to a different, different dance. Yeah. Like we can see yeah. the surface of Venus. Yes. Using so some like modern scientific tools. Yeah, but to feel her, to mm. encounter her, like we need the dark senses. So I think this is like a very profound, like negative, like a critique. It's like, okay, we need to have the body in our methodology, period, if we're interested in any of these truth discourses. Um, yeah, and then, so there's the beheading aspect, but then there's also this other maybe powerful thing that is just coming, which is about sexuality. You know, like yeah. actually feminine se sexuality, which is, you know, so such a site of conflict. You know, there's so there's slut shaming, and there's oh, yeah. all this stuff around. Like we can't not allow that, and you have to have sex with one man. You know, and or or you're you, you know yeah. you're not worth worth anything. Your self worth is low. Um, so, but where do those discourses come from? Where do you think those discourses come from? I think they come from like maybe men who are afraid of it, you know, afraid of why like, do you yeah. why do you think it comes from men? Well, I feel like maybe this point about like not to be like too Freudian about it, but like I think like maybe there's an insecurity. Like I don't have uh you know as close i think men can access this but it's not maybe as intuitive or as natural and so it's like oh if i can't have it let me like venerate the penis essentially like this is better. but if, if men men's main drive is towards sex why would men slut shame women and try to stop them having sex i don't know it's confusing um my my, my personal feeling is that a lot of this controls on female sexuality come from women really it's actually intersexual politics and has much more to do with women's relationship to other women than with men hmm. okay. i think that you can't consider female sexuality without considering male sexuality and vice versa yeah. and i think that's the same whether you're like heterosexual bisexual or homosexual mm -hmm. i mean even if you're homosexual your body is still the evolutionary design 
that fundamentally is meant to engage with the other sex on a physical level and is supposed to either inseminate or carry a child. So yeah. um, even if you're two men or two women, that body that you are erotically aroused by and which is your your erotic being in the world is still a body which is necessarily in relation to the other body, even if it's not the body that you are aroused by. Mm. And so I think there's always this shadow, whether you're, I don't know if this corresponds at all to Jung's anima and animus ideas, but for me, my sense is that, because I'm thinking of it purely in terms of the body, but then this necessarily has to have a psychic or, or other aspects, other, other um, reflections. And you cannot consider female sexuality apart from male sexuality and vice versa. And I think because fundamentally the bodies are designed for bringing life forward, but that's not what, <laughs> that's not the only thing. Like I think Eros, the, the, their amount of erotic energy is far, 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 far more than you could ever need in order to just keep the species alive. So it's clear that it's not just for that. And um, a lot of the other things I'm looking at at the moment are sort of feeding into this. I'm quite fascinated by the Sofianic heresy in huh? uh, the Russian tradition, because yeah. um, I, uh, during the lockdown, I became very interested in the work of Pavel Florensky. And so I looked sort of as well at... Um, Soloviev, who is another Sofianic, um, a religious philosopher, um, and also the uh, Alexandra Kozhev, who I opened with talking about desire, is the presence of absence. He, um, he was also, um, his work was also inspired a lot by Soloviev's work, but he took it into an atheist direction and, but he was still um, about philosophy, philosophia, the love of wisdom. Yes. So again, it's back to this this kind of knowing, this wisdom. And where was I coming from? I started off going towards uh, Pavel and and the, the the this the yes, this 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 feminine wisdom mm -hmm. is so kind of fundamental. But I can't see this. Oh, so there, there's a sense within Soloviev's work that erotic love and, and bodily erotic love is actually very important to mm -hmm. the divine, to the becoming closer to God, to bring us closer to God. So he saw that part of our evolutionary imperative is that not only are we just meant to produce children, but the eros. And I think this is a, within also the work of um, Lou Andrea Salome. The, yeah. yeah, so um, her work on the erotic is also very interesting to me. Yeah, um, it's things that informed my work. Yeah, thank you for for that one. Um, the Salome reference. Uh, well, yeah. So, so this um, eroticism as like a way of knowing is like so intriguing to me. Um, so mm -hmm. we've got like the the okay. Let's let, let's let the thought and the language, you know. Um, go and speak from eroticism. Yeah, that is like, I think really interesting coming out of your work, um, your your dance work. And then I wanted to ask about this, so this like spectrum of sexuality, right? Masculine. So if you Wikipedia Babylon, you'll see that she's yeah. like an avatar of feminine female sexuality. And that, I don't know why, that was like very, that phrase was like very evocative for me i've been really trying to in my dance practice like feel what what that is like and actually maybe i'll just indulge in some like self-awareness right now is yeah. in my work i'm working with college students so emerging adults and i work with a lot of women young women and this is a major site of conflict for them you know their sexuality and it's a big threshold for us to be you know identifying as a man it's a big threshold for us to pass through, which is like, when can we be comfortable talking about sex and eroticism and when is that safe? Um, so it's like, from an empathy perspective, I'm th I think that's why I'm really trying to connect with this uh, mm -hmm. for myself and then also the people I work with. Um, but yeah, like, can we talk about one thing that really helped that I, as a reference point that maybe you could touch on if you want to, 
um, is like just thinking about the sun and the moon and like testosterone and estrogen, yeah. like those cycles. That was actually very helpful for me uh, to think about, um, you know, like this daily cycle and then this lunar cycle. Um, but can we explore the tapestry, like the spectrum of sexuality and like when do things cross from masculine to feminine and just that whole that yeah. whole spe spectrum? Yeah, you, sure. Yeah. We'll try and do that without getting cancelled, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know that's a good good point um but yeah i'm just i'm just reference to the culture wars <laughs> yeah um you get canceled it's worth well, it. this is where i think venus is very interesting and why i'm obsessed with venus um because venus as a planet reconciles so many cycles so if you want to be really um, essentialist is not the word, but if you could like make a binary and say, well, the sun is masculine, the moon is feminine, which isn't true at all because there are male moons and female moons and male suns and female suns. You know, um, Amaterasu is a female solar god in uh, the Japanese tradition in Shintoism, and the origin of the the sort of the performing arts comes through her. So you can't oh. really say male female sun moon i don't think like that but and even estrogen testosterone we both have the mm -hmm. same hormones but just in different quantities released in different ways um men are primarily visual in the the sense is that if you for example see the object of your lust it will stimulate testosterone whereas women can generate that by looking at almost anything like you know have you seen the the <laughs> Uh, the research on like women kind of get off on all kinds of yeah. stimulation men specifically turned on by what turns them on so mm -hmm. um, another reason why I, I don't really like this sort of essentializing this sort of castigation of men by feminists for being visually driven it's like well that's what men are deal with it it's not like a bad thing it's like there's power there there's power there there's power there for women that want to understand it and actually recognize it rather than you know uh try to castigate men all the time which i see happening a lot these days mm. and and this humanization of male sexuality i think is another thing which is sort of driving they're both a sort of a a demonization of male sexuality and then a feminization of it is being mm. sort of pushed into feminine expressions and um I guess there is a spectrum in terms of you can say men and women both have masculine and feminine traits or expressions which lean more one way or another but um I think that the male and female sexualities have to be understood in relation to each other and not in isolation. Mm. And um, what I found, because I was trying to come to terms with my own sexuality, my own sexual response, understand how my own eros functions. And I would read many academic works or feminist works and there was a lot of talk about how, you know, woman is the dark continent, you know, I think it was Freud that termed her sexuality like this and sort of using a colonialist yeah. image, of, like she's unknown, she hasn't been, mm. you know, conquered yet, this is mm. dangerous, <laughs> yeah. barbaric sexuality, mm. but this unknown woman, the more I looked at, it's like, yes, woman's sexuality is not as deeply explored as it could have been there's been a lot of constraints and those haven't been simply because of the patriarchy i think a lot of it has been intersexual politics within whether it's a patriarchal society or a post i think we're in post patriarchal societies now in the west i wouldn't even describe it as patriarchal i would say that we've largely overthrown those old structures and um you will find patriarchies if you go to Saudi Arabia or Iran and places that there are actually, you know, women do have still to fight for basic rights. This isn't the world we're living in, in England or America. Mm -hmm. um, now I've lost my thought again. <laughs> I'm going to have to, to write these things down. Um, but I also realized, yes, I also realized that not only is the female sexuality sort of underexplored 
so is male sexuality so little mm. is actually known about it i i looked i did so many like researches and it's like i keep coming up against ah oh, um these are in recent articles uh so much is starting to come to light now so that this idea that everything has been i would say sexuality full stop has not even begun to be looked at as it should and i kind of get frustrated with ideological um approaches to these because they already set out to find something so i distance myself now from a lot of feminist thought because i find that it's it can be anti-man a lot and it can be very controlling of other women and it can set a lot of ideas down there are some feminist writers i really love like um, i don't know if they even regard themselves as feminists but they're usually considered like iragarai or kristeva yeah sure um, mm -hmm. Helen, who is uh, mm -hmm. another whose work i find really subtle and probing and interesting in discourse with other writers like lacan and so on who again have problems regarding female sexuality and for example describing it as a lack and a woman as a whole and kind of essentializing around these ideas which are um i think they're the wrong archetype to understand because when you look at woman there's no lack there there's life it's mm. not an emptiness that a woman is um and it also kind of writes all the agency onto the side of man rather than actually acknowledging that for example the woman controls the uh, environment within her body during intercourse so that she decides or sets the the boundaries for which sperm might even make it to Ooh. to fertilize the egg so on these levels i think that the, the this hidden agency of woman is very very instrumental in how how we function as as humans but is completely not acknowledged in these very broad ideas about woman is passive or woman as whole and man is active and man as like you know spear or arrow and these kind of archetypes which are sort of artificial and culturally imposed yeah oh yeah this this uh discussion on yeah sexuality gender it's so interesting. Yeah, this idea. Okay, I'll just, I won't reflect at all on that last really fascinating point. And I'll just ask another question because I was wondering, I don't think I've heard you talk about this. So masculine, the masculine sexuality, does Babylon have a consort for you? What is uh, the Babylon? Beast? The beast. So you would accept like the more thalamic. Um, um, well, it doesn't have to be in terms, because if you look at the beast, the archetype of the beast, you can find it in Plato, okay. the multifarious beast the drives so i personally the way i work with peter is that we we think of it in a much uh, deeper way it's uh and and also broader mm -hmm. it's not the thalamic thing is a very limited and and a religious framework that just does not resonate with me in a working sense but those images are so potent Mm -hmm. um, and those images come from Revelation rather than Thelema. So even then you can find them in Revelation and you go back and you also see that John was probably, when he spoke about the beast, not just referencing the ancient Near Eastern cults and, and survivals, but also Plato and the multifarious beast and the idea of these drives within the body. And so this, Peter will be writing on this, so you should talk to Peter about Okay. This male sexuality maybe sometime, okay. because he is much better equipped to to speak about that um, than I am. But but also like when one thinks about Babylon as an archetype of female sexuality, as I said, you can't really think about female sexuality without male sexuality, and you can't think about the male sexuality without thinking of this the shadow side in the female. And so, yes, you can place it in the beast and the beast also contains the feminine aspect. One of the heads of the beast in Crowley is the adulterous woman. So you have, mm. you know, the figure who represents, uh, and Peter's going to write about this and it will be much better than I can explain. But these, just in the same way that uh, Babylon contains a kind of maleness in her aggressive drive, you would identify this as a masculine characteristic 
and it's there in Inanna Ishtar, which is like consider Inanna Ishtar to be like the kind of the, the, the prehistory of Babylon. If you go really, if you trace back beyond Revelation and the love goddesses, you get to Inanna. And there is this masculine element in her persona as well. And in the beast, there is this like drop of the feminine, mm. this understanding. So within each body, there's a, a splinter of the other. Yeah. This otherwise you couldn't recognize it as other if there wasn't something entangled. So I think that we, we are in an entangled state, even as creatures, men and women. Yeah, it's so interesting. This entanglement and yeah, the beast, like I know, I know this like intellectually, but I haven't really explored it like in my body, like this beast. And it maybe this is like a little bit of this entanglement, because I actually see the it's coming through my relationship to my mother. Um, you know, she describes herself as a grizzly bear. So yeah. she has this protective energy that's very fierce, actually. Um, but that's not the most like nurturing, you know, it's his claws, you know, yeah. and you it's see it's a like, very important female energy. Yeah, it's very important female energy. And um, but it's very beast like, you know, that's like literally like yeah. a beast, a bear. Oh, yes. There are very bestial aspects to Babylon that I've explored in my work. Like the Beast yeah. of Shia was this animal transformation that was inspired also by the transforming into a jaguar and mm -hmm of the, the Mayan or South American peoples. And certain experiences I had on ayahuasca where I could feel my body being transformed in the skeleton and then through my you know, fur coming out of me. And uh, like, yeah, just sort of, and sometimes I experience my aura almost as a fur around me, like the close part. Mm. And feel like you can brush it in different ways and it, it feels yeah. like fur like a pelt so I, I I have also I and so there are these sort of I'm very interested in hybrid forms in my dancing I'm interested in hybrid forms in the forms that are like cat-like with the feline forms the serpent forms the bird forms are very important archetypical forms that I try to find within my human body so I think a lot in terms of hybridity in my like dance practice in exploring movements like moving my body towards these other creatures that are part of our history, but also maybe part of where we're going. Both. Yeah. Where our history and where we're going. I wonder maybe if you'll indulge me in this, like this hybrid, this hybrid mm -hmm. idea, like I wonder if we could um, integrate your work of hybrid, the hybrid into like some ideas in psychology around transference and counter-transference, like becoming part of the person actually, um, like feeling like empathy. It's like, I'm part of this person. <laughs> um, it's like such an interest. Well, first of all, I should, uh, this fur idea, this is very evocative, like for the, um, clearing the aura or like, Oh, what's tangled. Like there's something tangled in my fur. Like, so I did want to yeah. note that that is very evocative for me. Uh, but I have to admit, this hybrid idea was really striking me. And so you reference some of my favorite uh, thinkers like Kristeva, um, some of these, you know, folks who are, um, you know, looking at psychoanalysis and bringing uh, some of this fem feminine aspect to it um, and, and, and bringing some of that critique in. I'm wondering if you've looked at uh, Spearlin at all, Sabina Spearlin. Or, uh, do you know no, this? I have Oh, I'm so glad to tell you about this. This is my advocacy for the day. Um, this is, I think, okay, my big Scott, project. What's her name? Uh, Sabina Spearling. And if you've seen the movie uh, A Dangerous Method, this is who Jung, Kira Knightley plays, and Jung is like spanking. Oh, yes, I yeah. have seen that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. she is known for this. I, I think I think it's sad. I mean, the, her work is so... So she has um, her, a big text is death as the cause of coming into being. Um, so she has yes. this, yeah, she has this real good focus on renewal, you know, which I think is an important archetype, um, like uh, death and renew renewal is very, very important. She, she looks at that psycho and psychologically and she analyzed uh, Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, 
Um, she was an analyst. She was, I think, the first. She was diagnosed with at that time uh, dementia praecox. So she, this is a real scandalous story with Jung, right? Like, so he was having sex with yeah. his patient in a, a polyamorous relationship in the earliest twentieth century, which is just such a drama, you know. Um, but she, so she had was, I think, the first person with mental illness in the twentieth century to become an analyst, um, which mm -hmm. is like really cool aspect of her work so maybe the diagnosed mental illness <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah 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 uh so but her work is like very interesting and she's known for this you know affair with Jung and trying to mediate Freud and Jung and this love triangle they all had um but yeah there's something about her work that I think why it was occulted and repressed is because it's very relational you know the analyst mm -hmm. is not separate it's not from this perch um, she would enter in to her and people were like that's wrong you know that's different relationship yeah like you can't be fused like that that is um, unethical actually was the critique of her and i completely disagree i think it's a fundamentally ethics healing and um so anyways i'm trying to develop a spirulinian psychoanalysis um because it's it's uh -huh. very, very you're trying to take up that thread and develop it now yeah, yeah. that's yeah. really interesting yeah and, it's very and, interesting. and your work will definitely be cited. I'll make the announcement here for people. So there's a book coming out. It's called Anti-Self. Oh, wow. This sounds interesting. Which is <laughs> equivalent to, it's a play on anti-Oedipus. Um, yeah. um, I'm from Pittsburgh, so the French is really hard for me. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Guitare, I'm going to try. Uh, the Luz and Guitare. Oh. That they have anti-Oedipus and, you know, in the Jungian tradition, the main artifice is the self. So it's not Oedipus, the yeah. main archetype is the self. And so through some of like the work you're doing and Spearlin's work um, and uh, someone named Bayou Akumalafe, it's also very interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're developing a uh, little thing. So anyways, that's pretty indulgent. But uh, yeah, Spearlin is very important to me. So I'm glad to, glad to tell you about her, her work. Oh, I, I will look that up. That's really fascinating. I love discovering people. It's always exciting. Yeah. I, I think there might be some resonance, especially with like yeah. re renewal, death. Oh, like absolutely, that was what transformation spells was about. When you said death is the cause of coming into being, transformation spells was um, the one I just did. Oh, really? In London, um, the first part of it, Natura, is about a dead being born in the realm in the amniotic underworld. And mm. the second part, uh, creatura, is this uh, a being that has come into being through this death being born. So playing a lot with death and birth and the coming into being of this other thing. So yeah, that was kind of, it sounds right to, it sounds like I really need to read Sabina's work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, let me know what you think. Maybe, maybe we can talk about it again. Um, mm. Okay, so we talked about like revelation you know, and this is interesting to, yeah, locate, I think this will be helpful for me to, in my explorations and work with Babylon, to get just because, you know, I've, uh, the magical community that I kind of grew up in in Pittsburgh, you know, OTO was a big part of it. So that that is part of my background. But the revelation, I guess maybe because of, they're kind of dissing her a little bit, it's kind of a diss track. Um, in Revelation, maybe I've avoided it a bit, but this, I just read this. Distract. <laughs> yeah, like, she's, she's describing the most amazing language. Like it's, it's, she's golded with gold. She's adorned in the, I mean, I know that she's destroyed and everything, but that's just, yeah. you know, they have to say that. But the way they conjure her is just incredible. It's like, you cannot fall in love. You have to fall in love is this. She's so powerful. Mm, maybe she's I'm. So, she's so brilliant. Yeah. You just I'm... have to do it. Sorry. Yeah, just get past the, the, the John's desire to smash her. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, honestly, I might be more so encountering like Sunday school teachings and less so yeah. in the text, um, which may, may be problematic for me. Yeah. This idea of, I just read a book from a union analyst uh, um, called The Archetype of the Apocalypse. And a point that came up by Edinger, a, a point that came up that really fascinated me. And so you've like referenced like Babylon or uh, in, in Yana Ishtar. And yeah. like an interesting aspect of Christianity that is very different. 
is it doesn't have a success succession myth. You know, this to me is core of patriarchy actually is like the, the king never dies in yeah. Christianity. Yahweh never dies. It's eternal rule, um, which is yeah. terrifying. Like, and I think most of the other myth structures that I've studied, you know, there's a death and the renewal is very important. Like the king is actually killed or sacrificed. And then a new king, like Jupiter arises from Saturn, for example, from the testicles, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, and I think that's something we're missing. Like, so this archetype of renewal, um, mm. maybe we could talk about that. So, so transformations spells is about this. Um, yes, it was a partly, it, it, it came out of my experience of the lockdown and also perimenopause starting, mm. which was kind of catastrophic on my health. And I didn't know what it was until I'd been sort of in it for a couple of years, maybe. Yeah. And just the being on the brink of deciding do i keep dancing or not and or it, it was my whole relationship to life was through dance and the body it was sort of my primary mode of being in the world and 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 feeling and i felt like my body collapsing and like also my mind i was doing really silly things and forgetting things and all the usual like horrors that go along with that and so transformation spells came out of that it came out of a trip to the peruvian jungle to drink ayahuasca i hadn't drunk it for 18 years wow. so my my last experience of uh drinking consistently and and um and working with ayahuasca and visions was in england with the santo daime a santo daime group in here in england and then i Gordon White actually invited me and Peter to like go to the jungle and we were like, yeah. okay, we'll do it. We'll be there for, for Gordon's healing journey and be there to support him because oh. he's a friend. Yeah. He's a good friend. But if you, I also had questions to ask her and I wanted to ask about this experience. Like, is this it? Is this over? Do I dance? And I had... um I had a very deep experience of what I call the pathophony, which is a word from Pierre Klosowski, but um, mm. this sense that every theophany is a pathophony, mm. that one cannot experience God without experiencing the divine physically, whether as suffering or passion, passion in the sense that like Christ's passion is suffering, but it's just a very, very deep physical experience. And I had, a very, a very deep physical sense of, of the body, deeper than I've ever gone into it before. And so my, my experience of psychedelics is often, I have a very strong um, kinesthetic and, and, and internal sensation, physical. It's not just visionary. And some of the days mm -hmm. I had very, I drank very lightly because the, the shaman didn't want to give me very much because of my... Um, my strength wasn't very strong so I was on a different diet to everyone else and he was being very careful with quantities so I would have very um the first the first few days very light and just very very embodied psychedelic experiences nice. something that I don't see spoken about or hadn't seen spoken about in the psychedelic world is the way that psychedelics um, affect your perception of your body the way because it really it's a very it's a it's like dreaming these are weakly embodied states they're states when you're very tenuously connected to your physical self but the physical self is still connected to you I mean I think even I think even when you disconnate you're still like there is something still held within the bones. And I had a vision even of my bones as well, um, a, a post-mortem vision of myself, wow. which was really quite disturbing, seeing my bones laid out, wow. things like this. Um, mm. So I had some very, very deep experiences of myself as a body, even to the point of beyond death. And that having being able to experience that and just surrender to that experience was very important to me being able to then go back to working on dance again and and bring something through and a spirit started coming through which i think of as the seconda creatura the second creation 
mm. which I, which was part of what the dance is supposed to incarnate, is this other, a being which is connecting to something on that other side, the other side of life. I do think that now that I've reached this sort of point in my life, I'm 50, that mm. my perception of mortality is getting more subtle and one perceives life in a, a very a much a, a deeper way than when one's younger it's very strange that you're aware of things in a different way so a lot of that is to do with this um when i mentioned earlier that the, the your spiritual senses maybe get sharper as your yes. physical senses also get abraded just by life and stuff there's a, a, a potential to actually work on other senses and the darker senses too are a big part of that yes Ooh. yes so you're talking about your journey recent some recent experiences with ayahuasca coming back to psychedelics um after yeah. a period of of absence um I'm, yeah, I'm glad. This seems like a good bridge to, into like some questions I wanted to ask you about like technique, like on a very more like, uh, uh, I don't, for some reason I want to say vulgar. I don't know why, but I just like, I wanted to ask you about like technique and a couple, like when I've heard, I've heard you talk about these techniques. I've heard you talk about like interior visualization. Um, yeah. and, oh, maybe just taking a pause and framing this like, okay, so we're now we've been watching you for like an hour maybe over and we're like very intrigued you know I'm putting this into the audience like we're very intrigued and we're like okay we've got this technique for or we've got this idea of like deeper revelation um connection to our sexuality deeper connection to our sexuality maybe <laughs> and like being able to empathize more deeply with what do you do <laughs> yeah, with, with, with like human beings and also, I just do, I keep bringing it back to the human being because that's just where my interest is right now. But this is very profound. And what you're talking about is more animus, right? Like in spiritual, it's like we can connect with being, like empathize with all types of different uh, beings, non, non-human intelligence. Um, so I do want to make sure that's not lost in my uh, fixation with the human. Um, but yeah, technique, because I've heard you talk about, okay, like interior visualization and the dark senses, which are like proprioception and touch and synesthesia, and then dreams and scrying and divination and uh, plant medicine or yeah. uh, encounters with plants. And all of those light up for me. Yeah. Now, I did want to ask you about specifically, because I am an avid dancer and I'm yeah. an avid dream uh, oh dream analysis a lot and, and a lot of lucid dream but I have to admit I know that these are connected but I'm yeah. still not they, 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 they feel like they're a bit in a different compartment for me and I've tried different experiences like trying to embody images from my dreams and qualities that are coming like while while in waking consciousness but it still feels and you use the word tenuous and I feel yeah. this tenuous connection between them but I was wondering if we could explore that together like maybe techniques some similarities or differences or comparing and contrasting techniques of like working with your dreams and working with your body um, as sites of, of affectivity, visionary knowing, etc. So that's a very long question, but uh, very you... open. Uh, <laughs> I'll just dive in and see what, <laughs> see what yeah. comes out. Um, well, dreams have been very important to me since a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, because of a recurring dream I had of my brother who died. Um, when I was three so I had a very interesting relationship to the dream world and also to the imagine I was very imaginative and very sensitive as imagine. yes yeah so the that, that was maybe overactive in me and I was also hypersensitive um and traumatized by my brother's death although I would never have used that word because I didn't even think of it I just spoke about I have a brother who is dead so yeah. there was a kind of isness to him there was again it's that desire is the presence of absence that his mm -hmm. absence was a presence in my life and um it very much informed my difficult relationship with my body with being incarnate with um how I perceived myself and a certain um, 
ambivalence in my relationship to being able to do things even being able to move being being like it it, it, it sort of fundamentally kind of places this thorn in you all the time or a wound all the time that that that's how I experience it even if I couldn't articulate it like that or I didn't think about it I think it was always there um, some of this came out only in work I did on myself much much later um, so dreams have had a very um, real presence in my life and I and the imaginative realm so I never from a very young age I saw it almost as though there's a continuity between my waking life and my dreaming life and they are both forms of knowing which have their own visual idioms which are related but which are still different and I learned you know I have some facility at lucid dreaming not all the time but it depends on what state I'm in like physically how tired I am or or what I'm working on but and this has been for a long time. I started learning how to fly in dreams when I was quite young because um, I would have these nightmares where I was being chased and out of the panic of being like pursued by evil creatures or whatever they were, monsters, demons, um, I'd take flight, but I would, you know, not have any control over it. I would just keep hitting these strange velocities where I would be just tearing through space and it would just be like, lights and sound crashing and um and then I would like wake up abruptly and be like in a sweat or a panic or something and so that the, what turned into escaping would become these like strange experiences of being like pulled through tunnels or lights and, mm. and noise and uh, these incredible velocities and always really kind of traumatic because I felt no um no control over it at all. It was just really strange experiences and they were rep repetitive, so it would keep happening. And at some point I just became conscious at one of these critical moments before I took off and I thought, I'm going to take flight now. And I, I mean, and I did this a few times where I would start to fly and I, taught myself how to fly and direct myself and I did one last night actually oh. well uh, not a flight dream but where I became conscious in the dream and I decided exactly where to take the dream and to go to somewhere and to open a particular door into another space um so I started teaching myself how to do this from I guess I was a teenager when I started to get the hang of it more and so I always experienced this, and also, you know, on waking up, the sense of the 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 world of sunlight being still like the dream world being still so present in my body, even in like at dawn, and having these emotions from the dream world like being so present, but within as part of the occulted body rather than on the surface of my skin. But still, you know, clearly having a, an effect on my sense of being in the world. I felt a lot of the time I felt between worlds from a young age. And the lingering effect of these, the light of the dream world. Yes. Ooh. How it carries over, even though it's this very, um, it's a strange light. And the colors of the dream world are strange. You know, the senses are, are different within there. So... There are like senses which correspond to our um, physical senses of our physical body. They correspond, but they're not limited by the senses of the physical body and they see into a different spectrum or they hear into a different spectrum. And so I, I always from a young age just had this sense and this um, when I met Peter and I became involved in Western occultism, this was just part of my baseline that I took into my understanding of magic was that I experienced spirits in this way and I would experience, I could feel their presence physically, like on my skin. Yeah. On your skin. Yeah. On your skin or, you know, your hair coming on end, like the hairs on your, your arms or your neck or something. You just feel it or you hear something or the temperature changes. There are these subtle things. And I, 
I, I kind of connected that with that awareness of the dream world or the imaginal world, which is so powerful emotionally, as powerful emotionally as anything that happens in so-called real life, the yeah. non-dreaming world. So I couldn't distinguish them. I just recognized them as different modes of my being in the world. It, it wasn't part of like, it wasn't fantasy in a in a derogatory sense. It was fantasy in the sense of this is another mode of being. It's so interesting how you say that, another mode of being. And yeah, this is super helpful. Thank you. I think super helpful for me and I'm sure the audience too. So a couple of things I was picking up on was like imagination and affectivity, really. It's like, so there's that's linking that could link potentially these practices that I'm doing is dream and uh, embodiment, like with dance. It's like there's some different spectrums maybe open up and like imagination can even help open up different, I think, different spectrums in uh, waking consciousness. But in dreams, it's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, so, and you've been able and there's something that's so fascinating um, about like your work with the lucidity coming because i'm like having this like working hypothesis i'm curious i'm curious what people think about this but as i become more intuitive and less controlled in my waking consciousness more control opens up so i just live in my life yeah I, I i say i have an omen based epistemology so i very much pay attention to omens and as i've lived with an omen based epistemology i've had much more less scary dreams and much more like I have more control. It seems like I have more control in my dreams. So it's like those forces, if I allow them into my life here, yeah. Yeah. it's a bit more chill in the dream. So I was kind of picking up a resonance there. So there's a dream, but then like feeling the affectivity, like feeling like oh, there's something with me that is a residue. I think that's like such an interesting, I'm going to play with this idea of like an embodied dream journal. Cause like the, uh -huh. the, the main technique that we are to told uh, that I'm, tell people and other people tell me is like write everything down but like what if you did like a body like oh what i remember is this pain in my shoulder or this openness in my heart like that is what's with me from the dream and like that is like the site of the exploration i think is like a really interesting idea that i'm going to explore uh, based on that response okay so thank you oh, cool <laughs> yeah um but also some of the things that you experience in dreams just couldn't happen like the yes. flight yes it can't happen in in like normal life um yeah very strange a lot of my spirit experiences take place most of my spirit experiences um take place in a like the, the really powerful ones take place in a dream space um especially with babylon and some other spirits too, but especially with Babylon, I don't know, I don't know, I shouldn't call her a spirit because I don't know what to call her. <laughs> um, I don't, I'm not, like I don't have a sort of neo-pagan way of understanding. These aren't, for me, these aren't beings. I think I described it in a recent talk. Oh, how did I say it? <laughs> I have it here still. Um, Oh gosh, I can't find it. It's probably not that important. It might be very important that we can be patient. Okay, if you can hold on and very much. Yeah, yeah, no rush, no rush. Yeah. It's true. It was really um it's a phantasmic creation, but I was talking about how um, Leotard describes this idea of the phantasm as this Ooh. something which takes hold of this turbulence of the libido. Yeah. So for me, um, I think of Babylon in terms of being a phantasm. So it's how I relate the figure of Revelation to Crowley's vision of her. Yeah. There's a vision which keeps recurring because the vision itself is its own thing, has its own... Um, subjecthood it's not a creation of ours but it can seize our libidos it can seize our libidinal energies and work through us and impose itself on us and speak to us and so that's how i, I think a lot of pierre klosowski's work has been very very um, catalytic for me in terms of how to conceptualize um working both within an occult paradigm but also within um 
dance and movement through these libidinal forces through the drives because i see buto as a dance of the drives essentially rather than a dance in which we um impose a, a socially conceived and 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 which speaks to other our, our human um other human beings on on a social level on a cultural level but it's something which gets beneath that yeah. and allows these drives to come forward and in which we work with those within our body and which we can speak to not just humans but as you're saying the other than human worlds as well whether those are incarnate or or disincarnate forces wow. beings um so yeah, I liked I like Lyotard's characterization of the phantasm as this thing which which takes hold of or seizes the our, the, the turbulence of our libidos. Because I think that the erotic and libidinal energy is underlying everything. And this is really the energy that dances us and which moves us, or which even freezes us, you know, which which yeah. grips us, makes us freeze in fear or or locks trauma into us. But it's the same energy which can dislodge that or or, or turn it into, you know, turn it into it material to become something else. Ooh, yeah, so good. Okay, so yeah, Leodhart, what an interesting reference point too. Like, I'm glad you're bringing his work forth because I have looked a little bit into it and this focus on desire and drive. Like, I think this is something we share is like following yep. desire um, and yeah. maybe like really paying attention to it and really honoring it and elevating it. And okay, so speaking of desire, there, it, uh, there, maybe I'll just follow this desire because I do really want to ask you about choreography and some of your work with teaching. Uh, yes. But this thing that came up, so this very evocative idea of like Babylon as a, as a phantasm that's capturing yeah. and organizing our libido and causing us to you know, right now I'll have this interesting conversation across oceans for hours, uh, you know, and uh, so it brings up like, I guess the term I want to use is like metaphysics or like spiritual ontology or something. It's like, what is going on here? So we, so this, this practice, this thing is like so interesting. So like, I'm more agnostic in the sense of like, I just like to do things and then experience them and just be like, whoa, that was cool. And then I try to hold my belief slightly, but I have to admit that like knowing what's going on and mapping out this stuff is pretty intriguing to me. So like, you know, like, okay, so we've got different conceptions we've talked about today, like the psychological and the unconscious, like, so maybe like, you, you, you know, Jung or someone might say like, okay, this in a man or in a woman, the feminine aspects are unconscious. And so like these archetypes emerge over time to help us or to really, I think more for young is they grip us and they like want to speak through us and they like push into it. And, and that's interesting. And then, you know, then we've got like various like occult me metaphysics and then we've got like, you know, religious, like Hinduism, really like everything emerges from the Godhead and then it just differentiates into different forms to like experience itself in like a divine play. And so Babylon or this force that is underly underlying our experience is just, you know, an express one expression of a divine Godhead could be another conception. So I'm just like doing some comparative religion right now. I'm just curious, like what you think about this, like in your journey is like, what do, what do you think's going on with this spiritual stuff? And um, what, yeah, you describe Babylon as like a phantasm, yeah. like I don't know. Yeah, because like, I, I don't want to think of it until I don't want to think about Babylon as like, uh, a god that, that uh, because yeah. she's also coming into being all the time through these experiences and through the world and through many bodies at once so you know there's no um there's no limitation to the way a phantasm can operate within the yeah. world and the outcomes with different people can be different like this is not something uh neutral this is something very powerful and this is something which um, could be very destructive, could be very creative. It depends on who and how it's working uh, through. And I mean, I guess you're talking about beliefs and how you sort of agnostic and just like to experience things. 
I I have this my methodology is that I really I do let everything be up for negotiation at any moment. I don't hold anything absolutely to cherish. There is no so I, I I don't operate within a system. I said at the very beginning, like I'm not really in favor of systems and I wouldn't really want to systematize what I do, but could provide pointers or, or guidance to do something similar. But I think that the idea of contestation that Bataille talks about has become kind of critical to my way of working, Ooh. which is this, um, he defines it as, this always being ready to question everything. Yes. And so the pathophony and this experience, the suffering, the, the passion is the undergoing, is always the moment this encounter, in this experience, this encounter with her or the other, the alien. I see Babylon as a very alien goddess in many ways, like the... And Lacan is great here, but like, you know, the, the, the concept of extimité, the extimacy, the, she is extimate in that she is right, she's the alien that's lodged right within us at our very center. This, this is how I experience her, this is how I experience um, these encounters with the other when I'm performing. And it's something which is like, uh, and it's a, it's, it's kind of ecstatic and enstatic at the same time. I think in Visitation, I talked about how this flight to Venus is also an enstatic experience and, 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 and opening of oneself within to the experience of Venus. So it, the enstatic and the ecstatic, these two poles are in that blended space of the performance, actually totally combined and integrated. Yeah. So... Um, the contestation is simply that when one it is this necessity to keep questioning, not to hold beliefs as sacred, not to hold any ideological understandings or, or suppositions as sacred, but just to work from that basis of pure experience and to, and to be able to be always open to the new. It's a way of being open. I think I've had to... Uh, think about it because I've always found I mean we're, we are we come now with so much access to information through the way computers and mm. the, the web works and we are not just having say what would have been wonderful like a renaissance education which was very set and you will learn clearly like the history of knowledge that was quite vast even at that time, but nothing compared to what's available now, the knowledges. And it's really important, I think, then to put this emphasis back on our bodies, but our bodies as bodies in relation to other bodies, not just me isolated in the world, but me in relationship, as in, in relationship to a larger organism. Yeah. Yeah, and so, which can keep opening out, you know, indefinitely. And, and the only way to discern, and discernment is so important, the only way to discern and to really make knowledge not just something abstract, but something which you really incorporate, something which belongs to your body, which is part of your way of being in the world, which you can actually put use to, is... Um, to bring it to the body and to keep questioning. And so one is drawn to the things that one is drawn to, like one, one works with this erotic energy also in, in following the, the course of one's questions. And, and you know, it's, it's a kind of obsession that makes me want to look like, what does it mean? What is desire? What is, this, what is desire is the presence of absence? Or yeah. what are the koans? It is to keep, searching for this and so the choreographic explorations and these explorations through the body which is largely you will think of an idea or work with an image what in buto they call buto fu which yeah. are like words or images or collections of both which you can 
yeah very poetic but which sort of stimulate something and start to like a seed inside and kind of open out into a world or an atmosphere that you can um through movement it kind of creates the movement which extends that world into the space at the intersubjective space so the shared space with the audience or mm. with the spirits if one's working like just in a, a ritual work um alone so yeah it's it's a kind of contestation for me that it is a very fundamental principle of the way i work because it's this necessity to keep questioning it's simply that and because i do keep having more questions like there, there can't be an end to what i can ask myself questions even if i change yeah oh the the okay. question and question and desire that's like an interesting connection that's coming up for me right now like the mm -hmm. questioning but okay so this is such a beautiful segue i couldn't have planned it better it was like so good so this Con, 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 how do you say consternation? Contestation. Contestation from Bataille. And you're so like, this is like a, yeah, and the theology of Bataille is really interesting. You know, it's like a non dogmatic theology yeah. and a, a theology of desire. And yeah, like these do dogmas are going to, if you break them, I know I, I've heard you and Peter talk about this, like, you know, a theology yeah. of Babylon and like Oteo, it's going to, it's going to break. Yeah, yeah. It's going to break it. Yeah, through. I through. do think that the 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 contact with Babylon kind of fundamentally breaks all of the structures, all of the religious structures of of that kind of system. Which so is, it's, kind of, it's crazy. Yeah, it's <laughs> so fun. Mm. It's it's so fun. It's like very intriguing, too fun and scary, terrifying, yeah, yeah. stimulating, all of that. Um, okay, so what? How can we try as a little project, uh, preliminary project? Um, so like a pedagogy. Okay, so let me tell you a little story real quick. So I have a friend and uh, she she's really helped um, help me get ready for this interview because she's been a professional ballerina. And so she's been helping me discuss um, and she's just recently retired. So we are, we're gym buddies. So we hang out at the gym. And so we're talking a lot about you know, in ballet, so you have like Swan Lake, right? And embodying like a character that's been played so many times, or like Hamlet even, you know, actors talk about this too. There's such a power to this, this form, but there does need to be a, a strong container around it, right? There's a dogma, like Hamlet is this, Hamlet says this, Swan Lake does this, so there's this thing. And and so to me, I think of potency. That's a word I use. That's a word I'm parsing with that. And when I watch Hamlet, or I watch your work too, I watch your work with Visitation. And when I watch um, some ballet, there's this power to it. Um, and then my work has been about, you know, freedom, like improvisation, um, like breaking free out of long neurotic patterns in the body that are painful and self-destructive and self-critical and breaking free of them with freedom. So these this tension between freedom and to me, like the constant, I don't know why I can't say it, the contestation. contestation is a fundamental tool for that. It's like, no, why am I doing this? Like, why do I have this ritual that I do every morning? Like, yeah. what if I did this instead? Like, why do I talk like this? You know, like just challenging everything. Mm -hmm. So empowering and, and freeing. Um, yeah. And like, how can we have like, then I, I heard you in one of your talks say like with visitation, you know, there is like a ritual praxis there that yeah. you want, want to share. And so like, what is like a pedagogy of the constant, the, like, what is the pedagogy? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to tell me again, again. Like what is yeah. pedagogy like, and how can we keep this? How can we have this potency with the freedom to question is like my ultimate. The forbidden question. Did you say? With, with this, uh, ability to question you know or this uh -huh, yes. question yeah. oh okay that's very interesting let me think um well i think it's really important to recognize this tension between the pure improvisation and something which has been especially 
I love classical ballet. I think it's incredible because of the the power in these forms that have been transmitted from one body to another body. That's the only yeah. way it's transmitted. And and it's incredible. And the this the yeah, the 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 purity of it is fascinating. Yeah. Um, and also because you're working with one story, one character over and over again. So these like Hamlet become like each person who has worked it puts their blood into yes. that, that phantasm, yeah. that creature and they're living. And I'm sure that it must be an extraordinary experience as a dancer or as an actor to take one of these roles. And the my work is quite different to that because I haven't taken, except with Salome, I haven't taken something which has, and I did that consciously, like not like the typical Salomes are presented, but as this exploration of a woman on at Menarch and becoming becoming a woman. Um, this threshold experience. Yes. That's what was sort of, and so I was trying to do it as a completely novel thing, and and uh, yeah, maybe subvert some of the ideas around Salome as well by looking at it differently. Um, so improvisation, like a lot of my work, is improvised, but it's improvised out of already having created a structure that mm. this encounter and this this sort of topography. The choreography, as I called it in the, the piece on where the diamond dwells, is uh, both, it's a, a space which is generated by the movement, by the dance itself. So just let the noisy thing stop. <laughs> it's a, a space which is generated by the body in movement and which is um, effective and which is actually coming from that internal so in when buto you work and i think this is in ballet too you have to discover it within you have to discover that within and then find it in the particular unique geometry of your own body and i think that's the same with any dance so there's that the one the danger i see with improvisation is that if you just improvise you may just be repeating Mm -hmm. patterns which are ingrained in you at a at a sort of a very early level of development and not even something that you're conscious of but you might just simply be repeating destructive behaviors or yes. um patterns that you've picked up like you know contagiously from something around you and not something that's really transformative it could just be Ah, oh, like it, yeah, it could just be repetitions of things, other things, without it actually being nourishing in a in a deeper sense or really taking you somewhere or really transforming you. So I think that even with improvisation, it's important to have like very clear boundary about what it is you're trying to do and also to introduce like elements of restriction into what you do and to always challenge yourself to do the things you know if you are if your right side is more dominant then think about leading with your left side think about you know instigating movement from a different point than you would normally would think about a dance as it appears from your back not the front so transform the way you think about your body or where movement or, or where you initiate the movement all the movement is initiated with breath so movement is breath but also that breath doesn't have to go through the habitual channels yes. that breath doesn't have to flow with your normal pattern of breathing even you know one can sort of work with suspending breath or making it slower and you know playing with the rhythm of the breath and the rhythm of the body and create challenges or restrictions for oneself in improvisation which actually ask the body questions it's not expecting so you have to put yourself in situations where 
you don't have a pattern to fall back into. And as soon as you find yourself falling into one of those patterns, I think it's important to, to kind of recognize that and try and think about it. So this is a way of like working with contestation within like an actual praxis as a, as a, as a body in the studio or your room or wherever you're working yeah. and start to sort of like, yeah, the other thing with the breath and with movement is that this it's really important sometimes to just let the whole arc of a movement or a breath happen. So to not cut it off or not let the mind cut it off too soon and to not get to the end too soon, to not like mm. just go, I've got to put my hand over there. So I'm just going to like think, how does my hand come from here to like to it to an extension? How does one find that? And and just observe and observe all the different ways one can do that or these different points that one can work with. It's, it's, I mean, there's so many, um, but I think restriction is really important. Restriction and and just these kind of games one can play to subvert one's own, you know, habituals or sort of regular ways of being. Genius, thank you. Yeah, that's like so helpful. So it's like, I think it might be an OTO thing, like the first par paradox of philosophy is constraint equals freedom, something like that. Mm, it's yeah, absolutely. Too much freedom is like, you. there is no freedom in that. Yeah, and it's true because actually what's happening, I, I do a lot of work with addiction. Mm. Um, and that is like, this is fundamental to this. It's like, it seems like freedom to just do the addiction. Like, I don't want to have to be sober because that's a restriction on my freedom. But actually, if you really inquire on the value of freedom, that the addiction has subverted freedom and that the act of being sober for 30 days is a gesture towards freedom because of all that is possible in that space that is being consumed by the, the addiction, um, which is such an, and that I was pinging and resonating for me when you were talking about the in a space of improv improvisational movement, if it's just the same condition mm -hmm. movement again and again, that is not freedom. That's, no, no, no. It's yeah, just repetition. It's just repetition compulsion, and but it's demonic, I think, and it, or it's 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 form of control by something that you don't even know what it is, but you identify yourself with it. And if yeah. your book is called Anti Self, and I'm really looking forward to that, so let yeah. me know when. Yeah. Um, it, it makes me think a little of um, Klosowski as well, because he understood that Nietzsche's um, death of God is actually takes away any guarantor of there being a self. Yeah. So we are just multiplicities. We are multiplicities of drives yeah. that Nietzsche also recognizes. And so it simply means like addiction is the dominance of a particular drive. It's not your personal freedom. Like, this self is just an illusion. It's yeah. limited by its appetites. And it's really like as, as a, an incarnate being in the world, as a creature in the world, we should approach ourselves also with this exploratory sense. Like, who am I? How, sort of, beyond our, our normal patterns and, and surroundings, just push ourselves into those more wild places, those more liminal places where we're not comfortable. Yeah. Like who am I when I, it, going into the jungle was like this for me, like we could take nothing there. We were supposed to just like no soap, no deodorant, no yeah. sun cream, nothing, nothing civilized at all. It was just washed with leaves, smell like the jungle. And and a, nothing, just water and the very restricted diet. And it was really liberating. It was amazing. It was like the usual noise and the usual things that you're surrounded by, your the, the special things that make you you yeah. are gone. And it's it it's it's a very profound way of just opening a space for yourself to explore other aspects. We spent a lot of time like just in silence and writing and reflecting and writing up our experiences or our thoughts or being internal. And I was doing movement in the jungle, like dancing for the trees, for the animals, whatever was there just for myself, for the river. And mm. finding that motivation, not in the eyes of other people, but just for oneself, finding like, 
undoing why one does things, undoing yes. one's ideas about oneself, because I think so a lot of what we are now, and this is really exaggerated by the way social media works, we do things just so they can be seen by other people. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to places that are, are beautiful and other people are there and you kind of take a picture and it's like everyone's there taking pictures of the experience. Yeah. But not experiencing. Yeah, it's fine. This, this thing. And I'm like, are you here because you really want to be here? Or are you here because it's on the list of like, you know, Instagram hotspots and this kind of... Mm. This is interesting, Alcasis. Yeah, maybe you just want, maybe we can just open this one up real quick. Yeah real quick and uh and then i want to ask you about how we can help you too so it's another thing i want to put on uh, the remainder of our score today um okay. but okay so there is a focus on another desire that's coming up for me that i'm trying to explore with this channel podcasting is about politics like is about i guess it's it's like what i am interested in in marx marx interests me because there is a succession myth it's like, uh, so meaning that there's monarchy, then there's capitalism, and then there's yeah. something else. So there's a structure. There's just the potential, whether it's scientific or not, or destined isn't interesting to me. But what's interesting to me is this idea of there's something beyond, like the way we're organizing ourselves socially um, isn't metaphysically real. You know, it's just a choice that's conditioned. Yeah. So I find that really interesting. And that kind of was pinging for me. And so like the slogan I like to use is trying to transition from a society based on violence to a society based on care or love. These are this is something that I want. I want to organize myself based on care and love. It's like a project I'm working on. And then the negative project is like trying not to be as competitive. Um, but like what you said, and I guess, and what you said there is I think like very interesting as like a, as like a, active like i don't know but like being in a place and experiencing it yeah full stop like and, and resisting the commodification of experience i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah. um what, what do you think about this term like commodification of experience like do you view your work in, in revolutionary terms ever yeah uh, like just kind of the subject of well, yeah buto is buto is in its um from its inception, Hijikata had this sense that dance is not something that should be a spectacle, that there is a dance which isn't spectacle, which isn't commodified. And um, it's also because he, and he was fascinated by bodies like, you know, male homosexuality, which at that time would have been very taboo in, in Japan and probably even the West. Mm -hmm. it was uh, 59. Yeah, sure. Um, so these are bodies where they're, they are taboo bodies they are beyond the 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 being productive like the the eros is towards pleasure and mm. and non-productive and so the dance in that sense is non-productive and, and, and of course there are commodified dances but he was very much against this commodified dance like dance for show much more interested in um like he would say, the movements that animals show to children, but not to adults. Like there's a secret world where, um, and this is also the world where the gods are in, are like inhabit. It's not the world that rational, productive, you know, materialistic, yeah. um, capitalist world. Um, I just wanted to take issue a little bit with your understanding of Marxism because my understanding of Marxism is yes there is a succession but then it reaches this sort of mythical end of history state where you yeah. have and that's very similar to Christianity and I think yeah. that's the weakness in Marxism is that it, it's basically just another theology with an eschatology that doesn't work because you keep waiting for you know this perfect state and I would also say there's nothing wrong with being competitive if one understands why one's being competitive because it mm. it's part of our our drive as humans. It's, it's one of the great things about men and testosterone is that mm. like uh, that drive is what gets rockets to the moon and like that's what's going to get us beyond. So yeah, there are really really there's potentially a huge amount of violence. Um, 
to be unleashed in that. And there's potentially a huge amount of creativity and good work. And I think that if you suppress the drive, you suppress the good as well as like just push the bad. I don't think the bad gets suppressed. And I don't think we can live in a world without violence. But I think you can make those choices as an at an individual level in how one does things. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be down on competitiveness. I think it's useful. Mm. It's potentially useful. Um, back to the commodification of experience like dance primarily one feels it for oneself first so it's not commodified if one doesn't share it when if one if what one takes from it is this sense of agency and empowerment of being able to move to to express something one doesn't have to show anybody like i don't put up i i don't have a personal instagram or mm -hmm. i just have a account for the publishing side of my work to communicate but I'm not very interested I think dance should be experienced experienced by the person dancing and by the people who actually make themselves present in the space for the dance and that's where the transformation happens that's where the living connection is that's the that's the life that's the important thing um yeah, if we are going to reconfigure the world, we have to start with these, like with this return to the body, because the, the drives that I see most destructive and Marxism is as much a part of this because it just puts the the salvation onto the body of the worker and production. And it's just as much about producing and production as capitalism it's just you know putting it in different hands but it still turns the body into something which is essentially a unit of production mm -hmm. and not not experience um so for me babylon is very important because there's no way to experience this phantasm without without the body it's the libidinal energy and this libidinal energy is completely like it overflows so much and it's the the energy that capitalism and and especially i see now with the way social media works it tries to game this yeah. both men and women in different ways oh i just got a decline <laughs> that was just a phone call <laughs> um um peter coming back from surfing <laughs> oh, yeah. so oh where was i um capitalism social capitalism, media. yeah and social media yeah. is trying to but it's always turning us out one of my teachers the the teacher who was maybe the most formative in my experience and understanding of buto komorobushi <laughs> he said in one interview that the outside of buto the inside of the body is the outside of buto like there's something that is the that you carry within you that's what Buto is in the world. It it comes out. It is expressed. It's actually the insides. It's the inside of the body, and this is not something I think that you can put into a capitalist system. Ah, oh, I think the dismantling of the system that we're in now, which is really like there's so much wrong with the world now, but there are we have some tools. I, I would just keep saying, keep returning to the body, keep asking the questions of the body with this principle of like, abandon your beliefs, like don't hold on to anything as sacred, abandon beliefs and ideologies and all of this like noise and yeah. just go to the direct experience of the body and connections, connections with the places where you are to the, with the people that you are in relationship with. This is the only way that we're going to reconfigure things along a line which is living, which is actually um, in concord in with life. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, really yeah, helpful. Uh, yeah, this reflection on politics, reconfiguring society, experimenting. Yeah, like not saying no to competition. Also, this idea of... Yeah, I guess like the danger of supplanting one totality with another. Another, yeah. It's Alcoholics Anonymous, isn't it? Where you yeah. end up 
I becoming do. Christian or, you know. Totally. It's such a good thing. You, you replace one dogma or ideology with another. And I think I think they're all very parasitical. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually um, like you were talking about Nietzsche a little bit. Yeah. This, this, uh, I'm a huge fan, very attracted to Martin Luther King. The figure of Martin Luther King, and he has, you know, and at least in America, you know, there's this very, there's this very watered down image, and they say whitewashed image that you're taught in school. But like looking at some of the prison writings, is there's this one that strikes me, um, which is the where he is affirming Nietzsche, he's citing Nietzsche positively mm -hmm. as a Christian pastor, which is so interesting, yeah. uh, talking about love and power, and that that these are like primal dance partners. Uh, that they can't supplant each other. And I think in my formulation, I may be wanting a more love. And yeah. instead of supplanting, it's a more of a balancing, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, it was frustrating to me, just something like in my city, there's 240 people, there's 240 people who want beds to sleep in and it's like 20 degrees and they won't open and there's plenty of money and it's just yeah. frustrating it's like why don't you just like open the store and pay another fifty thousand dollars so people don't die and it's like won't do it and it's just so frustrating to me um and so that's what i'm talking about with the love it's just like to me it's like how can you not just see someone sleeping that wants to not sleep outside and just be like of course yeah we have a room come in like we'll open this and pay someone to staff it yeah. Uh, if there is a surplus available, but there's all kinds of reasons why that that doesn't happen. Um, yeah. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So, but but then it like completely demonizing or invalidating competition and like the engine of growth and this kind of growth uh, yeah. thing is like it's actually really cool and dynamic. Um, yeah, yeah, competition is necessary for growth, and it is how we also like take take things further yeah um, i think as well you see this a lot with people on the left is a, a failure to understand how power works how power thinks and a, a difficulty with taking power um yeah with actually like or not taking power but with using it wielding with, yeah. with power with power in general there's a really difficult relationship and i think so the West is the West. the The left tends to be the the side that has more empathy and is more socially conscious. Um, I think personally, we need a dialectic in politics. I think we need to have multiple voices um, able to contribute to the discourse. I don't think there should be a kind of totalitarian anything. I yeah. think that. Um, that would just lead to stagnation and tyranny immediately. And we've got enough of that as it is. So I think people, particularly working in caring professions like you are, like working with people and working to, you know, repair minds and bodies and, and bring people back to a sense of themselves as able to, to function. It's important to not, not demonize things like power because yeah. actually that's just giving it up. And I think, I don't know, my experience of the body is has been one of taking back power rather than feeling as though something's been taken from me by circumstances or whatever. So it is that the return to the body for me is very much, because what I see is happening now is an abandonment of the body almost on a like a, a huge scale yes. with people fleeing into social media, into preferring, you know, avatars rather than their own flesh. flesh and so on. And this immense pain that is clearly attached and embedded within bodies is sort of one of the reasons people find it easier to bleed into these other like more uh disembodied realms like the internet mm -hmm. so for me it is everything has been about taking the body as the primal 
a primal site where we have to acknowledge what we are, our vulnerabilities, our pain, as well as our power, um, and 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 the wholeness of what we are, not not a not a kind of castrated or a mm. limited idea, and just sort of getting beyond some of these ideas. Like I said to you at the beginning, and I, I kind of pushed back a little at this idea of the patriarchy controlling women. It's actually mm. mainly women who control women. Not mm. women. Yeah, of course, there's re uh, sort of residues of patriarchy. There's vestiges of patriarchy in our cultures. We haven't, you know, overthrown everything, but there are also, I would say now we're in a a world that's much more the West, much more friendly for women and 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 sort of the feminine energies in the way that you know office work is more feminine than sure men traditionally get satisfaction from, which is doing physical work, mm. you know something real, something tangible, something that involves skill and craft. And what you also find with the loss of the body is the loss of all of the crafts and the techniques that go with those bodies that are known by bodies. I mean, dancers will tell you this, your, your ballet dancer friend will tell you about the, the history of, of bodies that she will have within her body simply by having inherited classical ballet technique. And this is one of the huge things that I think has been lost, particularly for men, and which is a problem for like the state of the male psyche in the West now is simply the, the changing nature of work into something which is based on computers, internet, rather than on doing. Doing yeah. is so important to bodies. It's so interesting now, because I love that this, the way this conversation has unfolded, because, you know, I kind of suspected wrongly, you know, connecting with you, a devotee of Babylon, uh, someone who's taught me so much about uh, feminine sexuality through your work. And it's, it makes sense to me that the masculinity, like you're helping me like connect with some, some masculine energy today. It makes sense to me because uh, I was practicing um, some uh, chanting Hindu uh, kirtan. And what I learned is like when you're invoking Shiva or invoking Shakti, you actually take on the form of the consort. So if you start chanting for Shiva, Shakti will come. Yeah, yeah. And vice versa. Yes. And so, so I think this relationality is important. Uh, that's something I'll definitely take from our conversation. And I did want to tell you, um, I want to wrap up uh, uh, um, yeah. a second. When we've been you are the longest piece of <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's so exciting um, for me. Um, I want to ask how we can help you and check out your work. But I want to tell a quick story, and this will help the listeners too. That I'm very happy about this conversation happening. It's heralding a new direction. Um, I put speaking of social media, uh, I was kind of mini canceled um, in my profession um, because I put on social media that uh, I work with ceremonial magic, and I believe that it is unethical to not, as a counselor, I have an ethical code which requires me to. Um, help recognize the agency in other people and also do what's best, beneficence. Yeah. I feel that withholding a set of technologies that could be potentially helpful and in increase agency is unethical. Uh, so if someone's having treatment resistant depression or treatment resistant addiction, the idea for a ritual or a spell comes up, I feel like I have to share it um, or it would be unethical. So I put that out. And it was so funny. The response was very polarizing. Like, first of all, I got a huge response from this is de 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 demonic and evil. So I got a huge fundamental religious. Yeah. I also got almost equally bash backlash of, um, you know, an organization I used to work for, Center for Applied Rationality. Distant, uh, like, this is crazy. This is really dangerous, et cetera. And a few different other therapists reached out that more practice in evidence based evidence based spaces. This is really dangerous and problematic. Um, and it's just so interesting. So now, like my response to that is like, I want to have cool magic people on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so this, if, if you enjoyed this, stay tuned. Um, and Alcistus actually referenced some people that we might reach out to, including Peter. So thank you for the amazing references and this conversation. I wanted to ask, you've been so generous with your time and your presence. Yeah. Where, 
we're we're into this and i'll put this in the show notes and at the front too so people uh know where you're coming from but uh where can we go to support you like how can we help um what's coming up for you that you'd like people to plug into um well check out my publishing company scarlet imprint because that's how i earn a living that sort of enables me to to do what i do with dance that enables me to have the artistic freedom to like not have to conform to any kind of preconceived ideas of anything <laughs> sure. um and i don't know just i think the people taking on things that i speak about or replying or developing ideas is fascinating to me because i have very limited time because of my time is split between publishing and and this research so I'm just very excited that you you resonated with things I've been speaking about. Obviously, you have a background in magic, so mm -hmm. you understand. But yeah, it's interesting to see that there are ways that oh, that my my work has able to translate to different fields and be be maybe you know part of different discourses. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, you will be cited and. Uh, work that we do coming forward and, and we can keep the discussion up. Yeah, check out Scarlet Imprint. I suggest The Brazen Vessel. That's what I was reading. Yeah, that's the one my, my essays are in. Yeah, I yeah. suggest people should buy that. And um, yeah, cool. Thanks, so, Alcasus. So and maybe as things develop, um, I know we've talked for over two hours, but I'm like wanting to ask for you to come back on again. So uh, when oh, things... I'm and... happy to. This was really fun. This is really... I, I like a discussion that takes me into places that like... Also, I, I wouldn't have gone. So thank okay. you. Great. Yep. And thanks, for everyone, for watching. Have a good one, y'all. Bye.